Welcome once again to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. This is episode number 84. Remember, if you like our podcast, you can join us at Patreon with Coach Dan John, or you can sign up at DanJohnUniversity.com and get everything. Thank you so much, and let's get started. We have a question from Greg, and, I, and I'm not sure if I completely understand the question, but actually that's okay. I've discovered many times in my life, sometimes in confusion, we get some new ideas. So Greg asked a very simple question. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the couch stretch for, uh, I'm hoping that meant tight hip flexors. It's right hip flexors. Um, I like a lot if you're saying what I'm thinking. It's when you put one foot up on it and you lean into it. Uh, I like that to stretch that bottom part of the butt, but it's not a good stretch generally for the hip flexors. Uh, if you go, if you Google my name or just go to my YouTube channel, and well, I guess you'd have to search, but I have a number of hip flexor stretches in here. But I got to tell you one thing: uh, I think when you stretch the hip flexor, uh, and I and I work with Stefan Fernholm on this. He used to love to shove his knee into things, kind of like the couch stretch that I'm thinking you're talking about. But what I discovered later, and this is from learning from Brett Contreras and a number of, of, of really good physical therapists, and of course the book Anatomy Trains. So if my left knee is down in the half kneel, uh, what I'm going to focus on first is being as tall as I can in the hip flexor stretch. If my left knee is down, the engine of the stretch is going to be my right big toe. In fact, even in the gym today, I told somebody, if you want to destroy someone sprinting, just cut off their big toes. The big toe talks to the glute. And so by pushing down that right big toe when the left knee is down, and make sure you're in a 90-90 position, uh, don't, don't push, just, just be as tall as you possibly can be with one knee down. The harder you push that right big toe into the ground, the better you'll feel the left hip flexor stretch. At the same time, I consciously squeeze my left butt cheek. And I said before, if this is Tarzan, you want to have Tarzan belly on your, uh, to make sure your abs are engaged. You want to make sure the pelvic bowl is underneath the rib cage. So be as tall and as straight as you can sometimes called the 180 position. Uh, make sure you're pushing your head right to the ceiling. And then, of course, it's all about the opposite leg, big toe. Boy, I hope that helps, Greg. And if it didn't answer your question, uh, ask again with the, maybe a picture. Thank you. Wes, pardon me, Wes asks a question, a very simple one. In your opinion, what is the killer application of machine-based training? The best thing is when someone's coming off of an injury, well, uh, illness, injury, or uh, the aging. Uh, I think machines are wonderful uh, because you can sit somebody down, show the movement, and then you can progress very simply with increasing load with the, the selectors, the pins, the whatever the machine is set up for. And, of course, reps and sets are pretty simple. The downside, of course, is you lose the stability and all the other gifts you get from real, uh, I hate to say real training, but real training with a barbell, kettlebell, or dumbbell. Um, what's nice is if you have somebody who is uh, who, who needs some overall body hypertrophy, lean body mass, uh, maybe some growth hormones, uh, maybe they're dealing with an injured something that, you, you know, it's not a wise idea to to load somebody after a total knee, a total hip, a total shoulder even. Uh, you know, if any of you ever had a surgery, you know, the surgery might have happened over here. But when you press here, it hurts over here because of all the tension bleeding through the system. So the, the tension that you get on machines is lower, which is an advantage to get people going again. And yeah, I think machines have a great role. Uh, for all kinds of uh, issues. Um, is it my go-to? No, but I work with performance sports. Uh, but I certainly appreciate what they do. Wes has a follow-up question. 
Do any of the killer apps change for this over 60 or over 70 person? Or worded differently, if the barbell, if the barbell is the killer app for the press and hinge, deadlift actually, is that still so for the older adult or does a different implement come to the forefront? Well, you have to define what you mean by 60 and 70. Of course, you know, I'm in my mid-60s now. Uh, I Olympic lift in meets and I, I do kettlebell certs. I can still do the snatch test any day of the week. Um, so for me, uh, yeah, I keep going. Now, same me, uh, throw in a surgery, throw in an auto accident, throw in some kind of disease, rules change, and you're right. The killer apps would change. <clears throat> I, I like your idea, and this is what I did after my first total hip, was I, I went in and I, and I trained on machines. Interesting, and I almost always forget that, is for my second killer app, I signed up at a local gym over here and trained on machines for a couple of months because I felt that the, the pumping of machines where you, you know, you get those, you know, uh, when you do, when you do machines, at least the way I think you can kind of pump out those extra reps that you really couldn't do. I mean, I'm not sure you want to do extra reps when you're exhausted from a deadlift, a snatch, uh, a front squat, but with the leg extension machine, the leg curl, you can kind of sneak in those extra, Ooh, and you can feel the lactic acid burn. Uh, there's a real value there. So yes, uh, you know, I don't like the phrase, it depends, but uh, sometimes, uh, Wes, it depends is really a good answer. I hope that helped. Thank you. We have a question from Mad, and I hope that's short for something and not a nickname. I like doing bent presses with the 53-pound bells, kettlebells. They're fun. I want to add them to my program and wanted to know if you have any suggestions on where they would fit in a program how often I should do them, what is the benefit of doing them? That should have been question number one. And are they worth doing regularly in the first place regarding the cost to benefit ratio and everything? Yeah, I would say no. Uh, I teach the bent press. Uh, I like the exercises that lead up to the bent press. Uh, the bent press literally is a circus trick. It's a strong man exercise. And I know it made a brief comeback about a decade ago. Uh, I teach it in certs. But the thing, and I explained this to my the candidates, the buildup to the bent press has lots of value. And I use the Turkish get-up position that we call the, uh, well, uh, depending on what, the kneeling windmill, the KW is what I call it, but I've heard other people have other names. So if the bell is in my right hand, that's when my left hand, my left knee, and my left foot are all in the straight line on the ground. My right foot is a, a 90 degree angle away. Um, and then I have the bell uh, vertical. And I like presses from that position. I like the elbow bend to the ground in that position. Um, in one of my videos, I go over this in some detail. Uh, in fact, I think it might be called the kneeling windmill video. Uh, I think there's great value to that. In the bent press itself, uh, I don't think there's a ton of value. No, I never have. And so it's, this is nothing new for me. I do want to say one thing, Matt, and I don't want to come off as cantankerous. I'm not. But when I get questions about the lunge, the heavy Turkish getup, uh, the bent press, uh, the, the burpee, a whole bunch of different exercises, I, want, I don't think I get grumpy, but what I get is like, why are you doing this when there's so many other exercises you could be doing that uh, the cost of benefit is higher. And that's the idea for me. Uh, if you're going to do them, I would say you would train uh, the kneeling windmills once, twice a week, and the bent press once a week. Uh, I'm not sure you want to do it uh, much more. Uh, if you make an error uh, doing bent presses, um, I would deload as fast as you can and... Uh, reconsider why you were doing this in the first place. Uh, I'm sorry, Matt, I don't know how much that helped, but this is me being honest, which is something on the internet people don't seem to like. So I hope that helps. Marcus asks us a question. I'm 33 years old, a truck dr driver, and in the Army National Guard. Well, good for you. Currently, I work 12 to 14 hours during the week, 
and about an hour, hour and a half commute total. So it doesn't leave a lot of time to work out. I've been doing kettlebell swings after I get home on days I work long, then eat dinner. I like that. If I have more time, maybe two nights a week if I'm lucky, I do a run and lift where I run five to ten blocks, then deadlift or front squat. I don't have a rack. Good, so you have to clean it. Okay. How would you tweak this? I also want to do okay on the new uh, fitness test for the Army. Yeah, so uh, for the fitness test on the Army, uh, when you're doing those swings, always mix in push-ups and do them the style, what we call here at the gym, T push-ups. Come down, T, hands back under, push up, down, T, up. In the humane burpee, which is the 15 squats, uh, we'll do it the simple way. The 15 squats, five goblet squats, five T push ups, 15 swings, four goblet squats, four T, 15, three, three, 15, two, two, 15, one, one. That might be a really good thing for you to do because that'd be. Um, well, it'd be 75 swings, 15 goblet squats, and 15 T push ups. I would suggest that once or twice a week. And the hard one, which you do 15 swings, uh, 10 squats, 10 T push ups, 15, 9, 9, which is going to be 55 and 55 goblet squats and push ups. You do that maybe once a week or once every two weeks. One of the things I don't see here is uh, the carrying stuff. Um, since you have kettlebells and you have deadlifts, uh, barbell because of the deadlifts and front squats, uh, maybe you can just carry those around. The, the new fitness tests have the carry in there, and so I would like to see you add that. Uh, you could do something as simple as, um, instead of running the 5 to 10 blocks, well, but you need that for the test, so let me pull that back. Um, when you deadlift, deadlift, walk forward a few paces, deadlift, um, uh, put the bar down, turn around, deadlift, walk back, put the bar down, turn around, walk back. That would be very interesting. That'd be a very good carry too, and that would really help you for the tests. Uh, you're doing what you can do, and uh, I salute you. Uh, that hour and a half commute is uh, that's a that's a serious commute. So uh, uh, bless you for for trying to get it all in, and and good luck to you. We have a question from Jesse. I'm a 46-year-old male, 5'9", 163 pounds, and 20% body fat. Your insights on hypertrophy and mobility for people my age really resonated with me, but I've also been a fan of chasing strength. My goals are generally just health and longevity. Those are great goals, but remember, health and longevity are not going to happen in the weight room. Health and longevity. Wear your seatbelt. Uh, wear your helmet. Flosh your teeth. Uh, did you go to your doctor this year? Do you go to the dentist two or three times a year? Do you go see your eye doctor? <laughs> see your eye doctor. There you go. Uh, do, do you eat uh, fruits and vegetables? Th that's health and longevity. Specifically, I want to be able to play tennis and golf forever. Well, forever is going to be difficult for me to come up with, but I'll, I'll help you as well as I can. And pick up hoop well into my 60s at least. I also want to keep doing strong dad stuff that impresses my kids. My question, should my programming focus on the hypertrophy rep ranges or can easy strength be the foundation uh, for most of the year given my age and goals? Well, you don't have to do either or. I would suggest both. I think this is why I like the workout generator so much. Uh, I would probably have you do uh, two rounds a year of easy strength uh, or just maybe one. It kind of depends um, easy strength might be a really good thing for you to do in the summer if you want to do these other activities like golf and tennis. Uh, so maybe pick a four-month period of year where you do easy strength. So that'd be two 40-day programs back-to-back, -back, and I don't think that's a terrible thing at all. Uh, and the rest of the time, you focus on hypertrophy and mobility. Uh, so just go into Dan John University, uh, plug in the, uh, one of the easy strength protocols, there's your summer. There is May to September-ish, you know, however that works out, okay? And then for the rest of the year, three to five days a week, hypertrophy, mobility. By the way, hypertrophy is going to help you through strength. Mobility is going to help you with a whole bunch of other things. And just uh, go away uh, and enjoy it. Um, if you decide, I'm just thinking out loud here, that maybe 
you need to do break up those e easy strengths. Um, I don't mind the idea of doing easy strength in the winter if you train at home and you have your stuff here because commutes can always be such a problem. Uh, I like what you're thinking, and it does break my heart a little bit when you write well into my 60s as if that's some ancient age. I hope that helps. Thank you. Got a question from Don about a very specific program that most people screw up. So let's hope for the best. After reading about your big 21 program and never let go, I decided to apply the program designed to the clean and press and the deadlift. So there you go. We have an exacting program with no variations. And so what Dom does, uh, pardon me, Don does is change it. And he goes in and does deadlifts with it, which I cannot I don't have any experience with doing deadlifts on the program, so let's see with his heads. When you take a program that is, is a do this program, like my mass made simple. Somebody asked me one time if you could do leg presses with it. And I, as I wrote back, as soon as I stop laughing at you, I will come up with an answer. Uh, that was probably 10 years ago. Ah, so here we go. I just finished my second three-week cycle of nine workouts, finishing the clean and press at 140, which is about as light as you can go to do the program, and the deadlift at 240, which, yeah, I could see that. Okay, so, you know, you'd be 21 reps a day of the deadlift. Yeah, okay. My question, if I want to use the big 21 format as, my, as the primary progression for these two lifts, a, how much time should I allow between commencing the next three-week cycle? That is, is there a limit to running this cycle? Yeah, I found with the actual program, not with what you're doing, so I can't answer your question because that would just be me making it up. And I'm good at making up things except when it comes to weightlifting. Um, the most I ever had the big 21 program in a year would be twice. And usually... Uh, if I had a junior do it at uh, high school, once he would do it twice as a senior. So in his high school experience, he'd do it three times. Uh, with collegiate athletes, um, we would probably do it twice a year if you were a thrower. Uh, once, maybe right before the, that, that winter Christmas break. And then right, oh, somewhere, if they have an indoor track season and an outdoor track season, uh, during that period there. Um, you probably could make it work in the early season too uh, for track and field athlete. So really just twice a year is my experience at the most. It's a hard program. I don't know how you're, I don't know how you'd want to do it more than that. What are some suggestions for the space between big 21 cycles that will give my body a break but not lose my gains in the clean and press and deadlift? Would a 40-day cycle of even easier strength be good? Certainly. In fact, I think even easier strength. Uh, I was working with one of our Olympians uh, a while ago, and basically we had two programs. We alternated a big 21 with uh, two even easier strengths back to back. Uh, it was option three, where the third week was a lot of uh, lift and sprints. That's that we do a goblet squat followed by a sprint, those workouts, and some ballistic overhead work. Uh, for this specific athlete. So those uh, eight-week programs took 12 weeks. Uh, math always is a killer. So if you did that twice, that's 24 weeks. You could you could do between the 12 weeks, a three-week um, big 21, the 12 weeks, and then another big 21. Uh, and that would basically fill in your whole preseason and, and early in, in your early season. Uh, your your off season, your preseason, and your early e, e uh, and then after that you just have to, we just have to depend on what your schedule is, how we'd work that out. Uh, I'm doing my best here, Don. It's always tough to answer questions about variations on do this programs, and it's not a negative thing I'm saying here. I'm just saying when a <laughs> when you're gonna do Rusty Moore's high carb diet and you decide to eat steak at every meal, it's real hard for me to help you tweak that. Or if you can do, orna <laughs> you follow my point, you're on the carnivore diet, but you also eat candy. I, I just, it's it's kind of hard to, 
to work around it. By the way, I didn't say those things were bad. I'm just saying it's hard to work around it. I hope that helps. Thank you. We have a question from Ben. I was on the sixth week of even easier strength singles day and happened to borrow a lifting buddy's belt. Never used one before. With the belt, I was able to improve my previous PR by 50 pounds and get it to over double body weight. Well, Ben, that is great. And congratulations. You're about to ask a question that's going to undo a few things, but let's go with it anyway. So my question is, is a lifting belt cheating? No. Are there times when it is useful? Yes, and I have a point in just a second. Like attempting a max lift without injury. Does this count as progress in the deadlift? Yes. Or is it just a mirage due to the assistance? I don't know, but we don't care. Uh, the only time I wear a weightlifting, beat, uh, <laughs> pardon, weightlifting belt is at Olympic lifting meets. And I wear it in the clean and jerk. And that's the only time I wear a belt. I never train with a belt. And the reason is I picked up this habit, oh, probably in 1975. So it's a new one for me. Is that when I put the belt on, cinch, cinch, it gets me, it gets me in the zone mentally. Click, click, click. I mean, I just know uh, that extra tightness is free tension. Uh, it's interesting. I wish I could wear something here because the day after Olympic of Three Meets, I'm always so sore here. Because of that, uh, let's break there. Right. And as much as I train, uh, it I just don't seem to be able to mimic the stress here. So that's always kind of a funny thing. Uh, no, it's not cheating. In fact, I, I applaud it. Uh, I think it's great that you did that. And that's my knock on people who wear belts doing uh, machine curls, is that they miss the whole point of what you have a belt on for, and that is to teach that anaconda strength that things like bear hug carries teach. Boy, I sure hope that helps. And hey, congratulations to you. Double body weight deadlift is a good thing. And I'm proud of you, Ben. Thank you. It's good. We have a question from Peter. <clears throat> Peter asks, do you have any specific exercises, cues, or tips for improving my glute activation during workouts and everyday life? Well, yeah, I'll do one right now when you squeeze your butt cheeks. Uh, a really good exercise with working with older clients is to have them lay on the ground and cup their own butt cheeks, their own butt cheeks, and then they just squeeze, and then you teach them. It's like the old pec thing I've taught my, I don't know if you can see it because it's black, but I'm squeezing my pecs one at a time. And you actually, so you just lay on the ground, put your palms in your butt cheeks, and you practice squeezing them. Uh, another thing that's helped me immensely as a coach is the glute band, and we put it just a few inches above the knee. So we're doing something like a goblet squat or some of the different hinge variations, not the swing because that'll be in the way, but the Bulgarian goat bag swing is made for it. While I'm thinking of that, uh, go to my other uh, videos and go to the hinge family and look at some of the different variations. By pushing those that glute band out uh, while you're doing a hinge, it, it forces the glute to activate in the way we want it to activate. Um, those are the two I use. We do a lot of hip thrusts. We do a lot of clamshells. Uh, today, even, in fact, I noticed after doing hip thrusts at clamshells, I was doing goblet squats as part of the, as part of the sequence. And I decided to go a little bit faster, and I felt the clamshelling effect of squatting. And I thought, that oh, that's kind of cool. So we're always learning, and we're always experimenting. Peter, I hope that helped. Thank you. Okay, so there you go. There's another edition of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. Uh, listen, uh, if you're interested, we have a Patreon account where you can get more videos. Uh, Coach Dan John, or of course, everything's available at danjohnuniversity.com and enjoy it there. Uh, if you have questions, reminder, if you have questions, email them to me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and I'll do my best to answer each and every one. Thank you so much.